Good evening. It's good to see everybody tonight. We appreciate you being here. If you're online with us, we thank you uh, for watching and thank you for your presence. Um, a couple things uh, before we get started tonight um, that I want to announce. There are cards on the table back there that were usually supposed to be filled out on Sunday night, uh, but they're all they weren't with the stuff going on uh, this past weekend. Some of those were not filled out. So if you could take some time after uh, tonight's class and, and maybe fill some of those out, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, also, uh, meant to mention, uh, this coming Friday night, there'll be a singing at the Panama Street Church of Christ. That's, the over, that's with the Friday night singing. So if you'd like to attend that, that's where that's going to be uh, this Friday night. Um, we have one more full month of Revive and our theme of Passionate for God, and then we will take a break for our summer series, and then we will come back um, in September, and I will, before this, uh, before summer series starts, I'll have kind of, the, kind of a schedule for Revive starting in the fall, so looking forward to, to some things coming with that. Just wanted to mention that. Tonight we have uh, Brother Gary Wharf is going to be leading us singing, and then our brother Mark Brennan will bring us uh, the lesson tonight. When the moment fills you are in this thoughts, when you are in service, Let me see. 
Father, we do thank you for loving us. We do thank you for caring for us. And Father, we know that we know that you'll never forget us, and we thank you for that. Father, we thank you for this time that we have during the middle of the week to come together as a church family and to to take a break from our work and or whatever it is may, we may be doing, and just to to encourage one another and to build one another up, to lift our voices up to you in song and to, to open your word, to hear another lesson taught from it. Thank you, Father, for the avenue of prayer, and we thank you for the time that we have now to come before your throne. Father, as we do approach your throne at this time, we just want to ask you to, to continue to remember those of our, our family here who are, who are hurting, who are struggling. Father, we have many who are struggling and, and hurting in many different ways, and we just ask you to, to look into each of our lives, and Father, you know be- what is best for us, and we just ask you to, to bless us with that extra measure of blessing that we all need. Father, we do thank you most of all for Jesus. Father, we thank you for his love for us that, that sent him down to earth to, to give his life upon the cross, Father, so that one day we can come home to live with you in heaven. Father, we just ask you to be with us as we continue. Be with uh, Gary as he leads us in song. Be with Mark as he opens your word tonight and brings a lesson from it. Just help him to to say those things that might be most needful for us here tonight. Father, it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We read the places of heaven. It's
Good evening, everyone. It's, it's good to be here, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, if you're online, we certainly want to welcome you as well. Um, when John Mark asked me to do this, and, and looking at the topic of what I am passionate about, um, when Brother Clip got up here and talked about history, I was like, well, I can't do that because I don't like history. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, then, then I was like, well, well, I could talk about science, but then uh, we had one of those. So, <laughs> um, so I, I finally decided on something tonight, and I, I think hopefully you will be blessed by it and, and find something that you can take away from it. Uh, so I'm going to put a quote up here, and you're going to finish it for me. So, okay, ready? How do you finish that quote? Teach. Right. As a 20 plus year teacher, this, this phrase really upsets me. And I'm sure if you were a teacher for some odd number of years, or if you're currently a teacher, this kind of gets under your skin a little bit. Because unless you realize and actually teach someone something, it really, you can't really describe what you do on a daily basis as a teacher. Because you don't just have to know your material. I was a chemistry teacher in high school for about 15, 16 years. And I know everybody's like, oh, I hated chemistry. Um, but I had to know a lot about chemistry a lot more than I actually taught high school students to understand what was going on when we did a simple chemical reaction in class. There was a lot more to it, plus I had to know information about each student. I had to know how to deal with different types of behavioral problems, different types of disabilities, different types of uh, students who were uh, other abled. They were, they were gifted or they, were, they struggled with something. And I had to reach 27, 28 different personalities in one classroom. All the while trying to teach them a very difficult subject. So when, when someone says those who can do, those who can't teach, they really don't understand what it really means to teach. And we can translate that to teaching the Bible to someone as you have to know more than what you want to teach. If you've ever taught a lesson to you know, little kids up through adults, you have to be ready for some questions sometimes that you may not know off the top of your head, especially in the little kids class where they want to know everything. And they ask you about something that came out of left field when you're trying to answer that question. So you have to prepare well beyond what you actually will probably present in that classroom. You will spend more time in study, more time in prayer, and it will make you a better Christian. Because if you've ever, if you've ever done it, I, if you haven't done it, I encourage you to do that. So the question is, well, why do I have to worry about being a teacher? Well, if you take a look at my picture here, and I didn't count how many people are in there, but if you take a sample, let's say this is a sample of the world's population. The world's population, and, we're, and when I use the term Christian, I'm using more of a global type Christianity, not necessarily talking about members of the Church of Christ. About 30 to 33 percent of the world's population ascribes to some Christian belief, whether that be Roman Catholicism, Christianity, Protestantism, whatever you want. About 33 percent. So if you take a, a sample of about that picture, 67 percent do not ascribe to any Christian faith, give or take. 
the people that you tend to work with, if you work in some industry where there aren't very many Christians, you can expect to encounter a lot of people who are not Christians. And the importance is, if you remember what Paul says in Romans chapter 10, and I know he specifically talks about preaching, but preaching is simply a form of teaching. So it's, it's more of a global lecture style kind of like we're doing here, but it's still teaching. Paul says, how are they going to believe if they haven't been taught? If they don't know who you're even talking about, this Jesus Christ that you're trying to proclaim to them. So it's important because a lot of people don't truly know. Now they may have a general idea of who Jesus is. They've heard about this, this group that professes that their, their leader has died and rose again and returned to life. And so they, they have some general idea about that. In today's information society, ignorance is really not an excuse anymore because in the, in the civilized world, with the access to the internet, there's a lot of information about Jesus Christ out there. But do they really truly know who Jesus was, what he did, and what his mission was? That's where our job as teachers comes in. We have to be willing to go out and tell them about this Jesus. I want you to think about your own personal journey and how you got not, I know, I'm not talking about how you got here this evening by getting in your car, but how did you come to this point where you take time out of the middle of your week and try to learn about Jesus more or come together to fellowship and to sing and to pray? How did you get here? Who had an impact on your life? Who taught you the gospel? Was there one person? Was there several different people? Maybe a couple Bible class teachers, uh, an elder, uh, a preacher who came and talked to you and taught you the plan of salvation, what it means to be a Christian. Think about how you got here and how blessed you are now by that. And then we ask the question, how can I go out and help others to grow closer to Christ? So, a couple things for us tonight and how you can become a teacher. This is Mark Brenneman's tried and true six steps and you'll be a teacher. <clears throat> Number one, you have to be a learner first. If you don't know what you are talking about when you walk into a classroom, your students are going to see it. If I don't know how to balance a chemical equation and I try to teach someone else how to do it, they're going to see that I don't know it. So the first thing you have to do before you even try to teach anyone is to be a learner yourself. Paul talks to Timothy quite a bit about being a teacher. And in 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul encourages Timothy in verses 5 through 8 with an encouragement about his mother and his grandmother who taught him the scriptures. He says, look at the example of your, your mother and your grandmother who took the time to teach you to be a Christian. And then in chapter 3, he talks about in verse 14, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from who you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through Christ Jesus. Paul, Paul, Timothy, the apostles could not be effective teachers if they didn't understand it first. We take a look at the apostles before Jesus departed the earth. They didn't get a lot of the things that he, Jesus was telling them. 
He was telling them different parables, and they're like, oh, what, do you, what do you mean? I don't, we don't get what you're talking about. The day of Pentecost comes, and they are given the Holy Spirit to give them more perfect understanding. Now, I wish we had that today. We could just, you know, sit down here together, pray, and have the Holy Spirit rush in and miraculously give us all of the knowledge that we would need to convert souls. But it doesn't work that way anymore because we have this. We can learn the material. We can learn from those men who lived 2,000 years ago and say, this is the same thing that Jesus taught them. This is what we need to know to become Christians. In Philippians chapter 4, Paul talks about the things that we need to focus on, the things that will help us to become better Christians, and then these are the things that we need to think on, things that are true, honorable, just, uh, and things like that. Um, he says in verse 9, whatever you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. And then finally in Acts 2.42, we see that the 3,000 people who became Christians on the day of Pentecost, they continued in the, the apostles' teaching, their fellowship and breaking of bread and prayer. They, they continued, they, they learned because that, that's the only way we're going to grow. So the first thing, if you ever want to become a teacher, is you have to be a student of this book. And just sitting down and reading it is, is so fulfilling, isn't it? I think we've all had times where we needed something in our life, that we heard something maybe on a Sunday morning and said, oh, I need to go home and look at that a little more. Well, that's, that's the desire to low. That's what Jesus was talking about when he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They're out there, they're, they're digging, they're seeking, and they're sharing it with others. So you have to be a learner first. <clears throat> of course, one of the easiest and most captive audiences you will have are your children. Okay, now, some of you may say, well, I don't have any children anymore. They're out of the house. They're gone. Uh, you got these little ones, though, that are coming around, right? Some of you may have grandchildren. Some of you may still have children. You, you have influence over children. Moses, or God told Moses in Deuteronomy, you know, teach your children. Because those are the ones you're wanting to reach first. Because you want them to become Christians just like you did. Proverbs chapter 22, we've talked about this in, in a class before. Um, you know, how we train our children. Okay, it's, not a, it's not a guarantee that they're always going to be Christians for the rest of their lives. But we know if we don't teach them, the world is going to teach them. And, and you may think, well, my, my kids go to school and they, they learn stuff in school. If you're not watching the news, you, you know what students are learning in schools today. Not maybe so much here in Alabama, but I guarantee you it's probably going to come at one point someday where they'll be learning about things that are ungodly and, and against God's law. Um, so if we don't teach our children, the world is going to teach them what they want them to know. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you're like, well, this has nothing to do with children, but it, it, it does. Okay? It talks about, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it's like, when I was a child, I, I thought about childish things, but I matured, I grew, and now I put away those childish things. That's why we have to teach our children. We need to we need to encourage them to mature, to, to go past, beyond what they learn in Bible class. You can't stay with that basic knowledge forever. You have to mature. You have to grow. Um, so st uh, step number two is, is to teach your children. Continue to teach those children you, you encounter every day. And that could include here. 
and we've got various classes for children. You can have influence on other people's children because, you know, they want that influence as well. You know, I was, my kids are in high school now, but I really appreciated the people that took the time out of their schedule to prepare lessons, to, to teach my children, uh, and then we would reinforce it at home. And we, we talked about, you know, when we, they did Bible Bowl, uh, we, we read the books together and, and try to learn from that as well. So it doesn't only have to be your children. Right? You can get involved in the Bible class as well. Number three, this is the easiest way you can teach someone. It's just by being an example. This is, this is the easy part. Okay? When you're around others, do you participate in what they're doing if it's sinful? Uh, are you influenced by the, the foul language maybe that goes on in the workplace? Are you influenced by the, the temptations to, uh, you know, get involved in the crass jokes that may go around? Being an example, being different is the, one of the easiest ways that we can teach others. Matthew chapter 5 talks about being a city that's set on a hill and then talks about being salt of the earth, influencing others by our, our, our light in this, this world, okay? We sing the children's song, the children sing it at VBS every year, you know, this little light of mine, okay? That's, that's what Jesus is talking about here. We let it shine. We don't cover up our influence on the world because if we cover up our influence on the world and let the world influence us, it makes it so much easier to fall away. That's why Jesus tells us, let our light shine so that men may see our good works and God is given the glory. Paul tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, be imitators of me because I am an imitator of Christ. So we can... We can tell others, you know, be imitators of me if I imitate Christ as well. Because if, if we want to be a positive example and help others to become Christians, we have to imitate those who best portray Jesus. Paul, Peter, all these individuals that we read about in the Bible. Imitating, them, imitating their example so that others really see what it truly means to be a follower of Jesus. People get a picture of Christianity in a variety of ways. Anybody remember Benny Hinn? I don't know if he was popular down here. He was on, you know, the things that he would, he would go through, People would see them on the TV, Benny Hinn, Jimmy Swaggart, uh, James Baker, uh, Joel Olstein. These people that are quote-unquote pastors, and, and that's what people in the world see as Christians. And, and it's, it's a wonder why people don't want to become Christians, because, you know, Joel Olstein and... Uh, I was, I was reading through some articles, and one of the articles said, the 10 richest pastors. I didn't bother clicking on it because I'm getting mad from it, I think. But, you know, that's what the world sees as, quote-unquote, Christianity, the mainstream Christianity. They're, that's the example that they're seeing. So if we want to influence others, they need to see our example. And that's what Philippians chapter 3 Verse 17 says, he says, Paul says there, uh, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. That's who we need to be imitating, not, not the Christians in this world, not, the, not that others aren't bad. You know, Tim Tebow, they've got, you know, all these people, they have some good qualities and there are some good things that we can take from that. We can learn from some of those things. 
But really, the ones we want to imitate are, are right here in front of us. Specifically, of course, Jesus. When somebody sees us, do they see us or do they see Jesus in their everyday life? Easiest way to be a teacher is to show your example. <clears throat> the last two are getting down to the nitty gritty. Okay, so being an example, that's easy. You know, just living as a Christian, that people see that. And we talked in our Sunday morning class a couple weeks ago about how we don't know what's going to happen. We, we had uh, a discussion on, in 1 Corinthians where uh, a spouse becomes a Christian and the other spouse is not. We don't know what kind of influence we will have on those people. That's why we need to have that good influence and they can become Christians just like we did by our example. And that's what Paul tells the Corinthians. But one of the things that we can do is we, we need to teach others. And we've been commanded to teach others. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus commands the apostles, but it's also a command to us to go out and teach. To well, That's why it's called the Great Commission, because it, it's not only limited to the apostles. Because if it was limited to the apostles, then Christianity would have stopped once the, the, the apostles died. But it's for everyone who becomes a Christian. Go out and teach others. That's what Paul tells Timothy in chapter 4. He's like, you learned these things from me. Go teach them to others, other faithful men who will do the same thing. Hebrews chapter 5, the Hebrews writer talks about, you should be teachers by now. But you've left the, you left maturing and you're still babes in Christ. You still need the, the milk of the word. You should be teachers by now, but you're not there. So you need to mature to become teachers to teach others. So how do we, how do, we do that? Do you have to, wait a minute, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> Hold on, we're getting there. Everybody has been given some sort of gift. Your gift may be different than mine. Okay, that's, we, we know that. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that we're, we're a body. He likens us to a body. And if you look at your body, you have different parts. Okay? My hands do different things than my eyes do. It has a function. My feet, my knees, my elbows, they all have a function. I'm not sure about the appendix. I don't know why we have the appendix, but it doesn't have a function, evidently. <laughs> uh, but every part has something to do. But we're all different. You have different gifts. I have different gifts. If we all had the same gifts, we would all be feet or hands or mouths or like he likens to there. Everybody has some sort of gift that they can use. And we can use that to influence others. You can see some of the gifts up there on, in the word cloud. It's kind of hard to see. It's, I wish it was a little bigger, but uh, knowledge, teaching, uh, mercy, miracles. These are a lot of the, the gifts from uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and Romans chapter 12. So whatever your gift is, use it for the glory of God to, to teach others, to encourage others, to uh, you know, give money to those who can go out to other places and teach. But we all have spheres of influence that we can, we can have a positive impact on right around us. However, there is a word of caution to this. Everybody can be a teacher. But James warns us to be careful about how we teach others. And I want to go over to James chapter 3 here quick and let's 
And he talks a lot about the tongue in James chapter 3 um, after this first verse. He says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. And that doesn't give you a pat. James said, not many of us should become teachers, so I'm going to take the pass. I'm not going to become a teacher. Well, you got to couple that with what Jesus tells you in Matthew 28 of how to teach others. Okay. He says you need to be careful how you teach others because what you teach someone and what they believe, if it doesn't come from here, they believe in you, not what the Bible says. And that's where a lot of, of people today, they get in trouble because they believe something that someone told them rather than what the Bible says maybe about that subject. Paul encouraged Timothy because, you know, in the first century, a lot of people were popping up here and there. They were teaching false doctrine. And false doctrine has continued to, to make its manifest itself to, in today's society. Even, even more now today, the false doctrine of, of homosexuality is, is acceptable to God. Uh, these, these things that you're seeing with gender identity and things like that today, and people are trying to combine the worldly with the spiritual, and they're teaching false doctrine. They're influencing others. And James tells them, you know, you're going to have a harsher judgment for what you teach someone else. So you better make sure that if you're going to teach something about God, that you get it from the source and not from someone else. Paul tells the Corinthians in chapter 2 is, is, I didn't come to you with, with great words of wisdom and flowery speech. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, so if I didn't get it quite right, I apologize. But, you know, a lot of people put a lot of stock in what, how people teach. They like to use the big words, and they like to talk about these esoteric ideas and how a lot of uh, quote-unquote scholars today say, you can't interpret the Bible, let me interpret it for you. There are people out there that will say that. We do know, though, God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. That's, the, that's what the Bible tells us. So when we try to invest in others and, and put more stock into what they say versus what the Bible says, we need to be careful as well. And that's what T uh, Paul tells Timothy there in 1 Timothy chapter 6. He mentions uh, <clears throat> um, teaching <clears throat> false doctrine. There, there are going to be people that are going to they teach uh, uh, slander, evil suspicions, constant friction. And in chapter 4, earlier, he talks about people want to hear those things because it suits what they want rather than what Jesus wants. <clears throat> so, what can you do? I got to be careful. I have to be careful with what I teach. So, uh, th that should not scare you off from teaching others. Now, the command that we have in Matthew chapter 28, does that mean I have to get up in front of a group of two, three hundred people and proclaim the word? No. Again, that may not be one of the gifts that you have. You may not have the gift uh, of knowing everything about everything in the Bible because I guarantee you nobody knows everything about everything in the Bible because there are some things that God has not given us on purpose because there's just so much that God knows that we cannot know at all. So don't worry about it if you don't know everything about everything. What do you know? You know 
how you became a Christian. You know what you had to do to be pleasing to God. And you know that was right and that's what the Bible says. And you can tell others that. Now, that is, does that mean you have to tell them every single bit of knowledge that you have? No. That's why we have Bible classes. That's why we have others that we can depend on and lean on. Why did, why did Jesus send out his apostles or his disciples two by two? So that they could help each other. So that they could be an encouragement, that they could work together. That's what we can do. We can talk to someone. And tell them, this is how I became a Christian. This is what the Bible says. Do you want to study it more? You can do that. But again, just being that example in your daily life is the best teacher that, you know, the, the phrase that you probably have heard, you are the best sermon that someone will see today. And that's, that's enough. Think about it. Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered. And Paul didn't do it all on his own. Apollos didn't do it all on his own. Peter, they didn't do it all on their own. That's why we have each other. So as we close this evening, I encourage you, if you know someone and you can tell them how you became a Christian, you're a teacher. But even more importantly, just by being a Christian and showing that example and showing your light and being the salt of the earth, you're teaching others. you bow with me. Our Father in heaven, we come before you and we thank you for an opportunity to gather together, sing praises unto you, and bow before you in prayer and study from your word. We thank you, Father, for the blessings that have bestowed upon us. We, we ask that you be with those of our family, your family, who at this time are suffering from illnesses or going under tests and we pray that things will go well for them and we thank you father that we can be a teacher for you in whatever capacity you have given us but most of all we thank you father and realize that people are watching us no matter what we say or do and we pray that it will be something that you would be pleased with. We pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.